So welcome everybody. I see that uh, folks are joining. I am really excited about this conversation today. And before I introduce my friend Elliot, um, I want to say how this conversation uh, came about. So um, since I took over the Fellowship of Reconciliation, I should back up. For anybody who's not familiar uh, with me, I'm Ariel Gold, and I'm the Executive Director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. We are the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in the country, and in fact, in the world. And we formed in 1914 in Europe and 1915 in the United States to support conscientious objection at that time to World War I. And so when I uh, took over Fellowship of Reconciliation, just a little shy of two years ago, I started to uh, really contemplate my identity around nonviolence and pacifism. And I, I've long been a uh, committed nonviolence activist and long believed in that, but I, I don't think that I, I hadn't really like uh, done a, a deep dive into my identity around it and um, into the meaning of pacifism. And so I, I, I started doing that. And um, that's been increasing in my time at FOR. I've been uh, reading from some of our, our some of my predecessors, the, the large shoes that I have filled at FOR, uh, like A.J. Musty, who was uh, one of the uh, most brilliant political thinkers and spent much time studying and contemplating um, his commitment and, and at times wavering to pacifism. And so as I was continuing, as I've been doing this, this, um, this study, this internal and external study, I, as, as a, a Jewish faith, wanted to look into Judaism and, and pacifism. And so I uh, did a little like Google who, you know, is, has worked on this topic. And <laughs> my friend Elliot Ratzman, who's part of uh, the Jewish Peace Fellowship name popped up, which was such a delight. So I um, reached out to Elliot and said, you know, can we can we talk on this? And he said, in fact, I, I have been researching this and um, have a presentation. And so I'm really excited to have him uh, with us today. Um, Elliot Ratzman is an academic and an activist from Cincinnati, Ohio. He is an expert and teaches on religion, race, and Jewish studies. He's completing his first book, which I can't wait to read, Sephora's Knife, which explores the ethics of Jewish anti-racism. It's such a, a necessary time for, for us to be um, really looking at this. With decades of involvement in the peace and justice movement and in the Middle East, um, he's also on the leadership team for Ben the Ark Jewish Action in Ohio. And uh, like I said, a, I'm proud to um, be part of the Jewish Peace Fellowship with him. So welcome, Elliot. Hey everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I'm, I'm really glad I get to share this material. And I want to give a big shout out to someone Actually, this is the second Zoom talk she has seen of me, which is it, it's Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb, who is a long distance runner uh, on the West Coast and part of the history, a living part of this history that I'm going to be talking about. So, um, Rabbi, I'm so glad you're here. Um, please correct any mistakes I make and feel free to pop in. So let me tell you, you all just like 10 to 20 seconds of how I got to the FOR. Uh, I was teaching at Grinnell College uh, during the pandemic, and I was teaching a class I've taught a number of times on Martin Luther King and his intellectual influences. And I read a fantastic book, This Worldwide Struggle by Sarah Ezratsky, who was at Union, which is about the history of African-Americans and the FOR and Gandhians. And I thought to myself, what's up with the FOR these days, right? What are they? Why am I not a member? So I went to the website and clicked on things. And and at the same time, I was asked by chance to be on a panel about pacifism in the world religions representing Judaism. So I dusted off some of these old pamphlets and books I had. And I said, Jewish Peace Fellowship. Hmm. I wonder what they're up there up to these days. And I, you know, knocked on their inter their virtual door and uh try to get hold of some of their other pamphlets I didn't have and realized that uh, it, this was a group that was uh, 
I wanted to be involved with um, that stood for things I stood for. And at the very same time, I got the call from Earlham College uh, to come to be their visiting assistant professor um, uh, of Jewish studies. Uh, as I was making my decision whether to stay at Grinnell or to go to Earlham, uh, which is near where I grew up in Cincinnati, about an hour away, uh, I pulled a book off my shelf called An Israeli Pacifist. Uh, and I looked at who wrote it, this guy named Anthony Bing. I'm sure you all, some of you know Anthony Bing. And I said, I saw that he teaches at Earlham. Uh, so I thought this was a sign from heaven. Uh, so here I am finishing up my time at Earlham. Um, continuing my work with the Jewish Peace Fellowship in its revamping of its website, its operations, and doing actual archival work at Cincinnati's American Jewish Archives, which gave me a fellowship this year to study there. Uh, American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati is one of the largest repository of American Jewish materials, um, and it has um, all sorts of great things. I would like for all of you to help me out, though. This is how I crowdsource my research. I'm sure you all know some Jewish peacemakers, maybe unheralded, who deserve to be in some sort of history of American Jewish pacifism. People you worked with, people you know about, maybe a relative who was at some point involved with peace movements, peacemaking. I'm gonna ask you right now, take 10 seconds or so. Could you put the names of them, whereabouts they live perhaps, and if you want to write a few words about what they did, uh, just to share. Does that sound like a good plan? Or you're like, no, Ratzman, go on, talk some things. Because I know you all want to share these great uh, souls. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, in the chat, put the names of some Jewish peacemakers that you know. And Ellie, I will collect those names uh, as people go. And as you're presenting. Do we know whose whiteboard that is? It's not mine. It's Fred, uh, all right, okay. All right, so keep those names coming. Now, I'm gonna mention a few books to all of you that have been really important for me and deserve all of our praise and, and a read. So while uh, I'm giving this presentation, you'll see some books fly by. I have a stack of them right here next to me, so I will hold them up. And so if you wanna, if you're going, hey, what was that book that Elliot put up? I will bring it back, okay? So hold your horses. Okay, you all ready to go? Let me give you just, 15 minutes of a quick uh, PowerPoint. Um, you might wanna keep the comments in the chat just to a minimum, uh, and then we'll all come back together. And Ariel and I will talk and we'll take some questions. Uh, before we start, I wanna say a few things. First, I just met with the Quaker Lobby, the FCNL, uh, a powerful group uh, heading, spearheading the, uh, so to speak, the ceasefire efforts, national ceasefire efforts. Uh, and I heard something very, uh, I don't know, I think a bit disturbing from one of the organizers who, who was saying that um, the problems in Israel and Palestine are all go back to several, several verses in the Bible. And I thought, well, that's a very simplistic way of understanding it. it sounds like a very Protestant way of understanding it, that we can lay the, the blame for things on verses from the Bible. Uh, I want to make several polemical moves for all of you, lovingly. Uh, one is that to understand uh, Jewish pacifism and Jewish war making, uh, we have to understand Judaism as a religion and as a, as a civilization in a more complex way than a stack of Bible verses different from your Bible verses. And so if we're going to address the problem, we have to make sure we are diagnosing the problem correctly, all right? Uh, I think these, uh, we also want to avoid ways of talking about 
Jewish violence that drift into anti-Semitism or supersessionism. And that's a very easy thing to do. Uh, so I'll I'll help sort of uh, help walk us through some of the, the moments of that here soon. Uh, okay, now I want to start with a, a framework from the Jewish ethical tradition, Musar. In this Jewish um, uh, anthropology, all human all all humans are composed of a good inclination and a bad inclination. In Hebrew, it's the Yetzer Hara, the Yetzer Tov. And in the Jewish anthropology, it's not that you suppress the bad inclination and get rid of it. It's that you manage it through uh, goodness, through the good inclination, which broadly speaking is teaching or Torah. And so when I talk about the Yetzer Hara, the bad inclination, that's the propensity within all people to be self-protective, uh, defensive, egocentric, right? All people have this. And the Yetzer Tov is that which pulls us out of that confining way of seeing the person. And you do that through spiritual disciplines, through mitzvot, through practices, Jewish practices, through prayer, through group discussion, through interpretation. Uh, you might think that every religious tradition has some version of this. I'm going to use this Jewish language for it. Okay, so if I sometime in the next 10 minutes, if I talk about the Yetzer Hara or the Yetzer Tov, the good inclination or the bad inclination, uh, that's where some of my ethics are coming from. So let's start. This is my little slideshow. Okay, so uh, engaging Amalek. Amalek is this mythical tribe from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, which was a, an evil tribe and represents uh, all that is bad and uh, hostile to Jews. And over the centuries, uh, Jewish discourse has has pinned the legacy of Amalek on groups of people or individuals who are deeply anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. Uh, the Nazis, uh, going back to Esther, um, the... Uh, uh, Haman is, is considered by the tradition to be part of a Malik. And now, you're, of course, you're hearing in, in the last decades talk, people talking about the Palestinians as being a uh, descendant of this tribe, a Malik, who the Jews are required to blot out their name and to, to forget, you know, to blot out their name, but also to physically destroy. Uh, now, most of this is symbolic. Uh, Jews, for the most part, over 2,000 years are not walking around looking for a Malik. Uh, but in the history of Jewish pacifism, I want to say that this is a new approach. It's to engage a Malik rather than eliminate a Malik. We are in, in very interesting times. The most famous Jewish pacifist is Albert Einstein. And there was a recent documentary about him sort of dropping his pacifism around World War II. Uh, we had the film Oppenheimer, which featured a number of Jewish scientists who, who were committed to a kind of pacifism before World War II, uh, before the uh, before the rise of Nazism, and some afterwards after the atomic bomb project. So Jewish pacifists are in the news. However, Einstein and these scientists are not exactly religious Jews and didn't see themselves as part of the uh, the Jewish community. We also have the most uh, revered warrior of our day, Zelensky, who's of Jewish descent also not a religious Jew, uh, and not even seems to be a very proud ethnic Jew, but nevertheless, a very unusual thing for a Jew to be heralded as a wartime leader uh, in a country which has a deep history of anti-Semitism. Uh, at the same time, as we all know, and I'm not gonna dwell on this, I wanna, I wanna take us in a different direction, is what we the most horrendous uh, series of violence done by Jews Jews uh, uh, creating a conditions of mass atrocity, of mass starvation uh, in, its, in in the state of Israel's war against uh, Gaza, against Hamas. Uh, and so this all needs explanation because now uh, it is the Jewish state being accused of genocide, a, a term once almost, almost entirely confined to discussions around the Jewish uh, annihilation by the Nazis, the European Jews, the annihilation of European Jews during World War II. Now, uh, what explains this? The first thing 
I want to make the argument that we can see very easily that Judaism has a long tradition of seeing itself as uh, it's uh, anachronistic but pacifist tradition. Uh, if you look at medieval uh, Passover Haggadahs or uh, ritual books, you'll see that in the story of the four sons, the illustration for the bad son is the always the bad son is always depicted as a soldier. All right. So the Jewish tradition, if you go past the, the biblical materials into the rabbinic period, into the exile uh, and the diaspora, the the materials in the Middle Ages on through early modernity, uh, war making is seen as something that Gentiles do. It is not something that Jews do. Jewish men are meant to study, not to engage in, in warfare. This is the dominant, I would argue, dominant discourse around Judaism. So uh, for those of you not familiar with the rabbinic tradition, Judaism today is pretty much an heir to the rabbinic tradition. It is not just confined in the Bible or the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, but is a product of centuries of commentary of religious culture woven with an eye to the Bible, certainly eye to the Torah, but an elaboration of the values and the creation of a religious culture of the rabbis. Um, for example, there are verses in the Talmud uh, about uh, that are, are often cited by religious pacifists it is better to be amongst those who are pursued rather than those who are the pursuers. So the value of, of like you might even say of uh, you hear this in some of the Greeks of not doing evil, but being it's better to be receiving of evil than not. You also have in the Middle Ages. It's a long story. I'll spare you. But uh, in Yehuda Halevi's Kuzari, he actually makes a virtue, a point in this uh, in this imagined dialogue that Judaism is a superior religion. To Christianity and Islam because Judaism has never done violence to anyone. And interestingly enough, in this imagined king's response to a rabbi saying this, he says, basically, I'm going to paraphrase, oh, you think you Jews are, are a bunch of, of peacemakers and uh, uh, pacifists? Wait till you get power, then you'll most certainly kill your enemies. And so the rabbi, written by this Yehuda Levi, is sort of uh, um, tempered and put in his place by the king who says, yeah, once you Jews have a, have power, then you'll be just like Christians and just like Muslims, right? So um, I want to make the argument that um, if, and I'm sure many of you who are involved with pacifist work have heard of um, this, this phrase of Constantinian Christianity, that there was a moment where Christianity became empire, right? A moment where Christianity became empire, uh, where it abandoned its peaceable roots, it abandoned its state of being persecuted, uh, and under Constantine becomes the empire. We might say that Judaism is having that moment right now. So the question may be, and some of you are attracted to this, this talk, Judaism and nonviolence is something unusual because you're used to hearing about Judaism and this, this warlike state that we're in, really the bigger question might be Christianity and nonviolence. Uh, that what happened to Christianity? And whatever happened to Christianity, if by some of the theologians, it's it's kind of what was happening uh, to Judaism. Uh, and for, for this, you can see uh, a, a great theologian, very influential on me, Mark Ellis, his work where he talks about the Constantinian Judaism uh, Mark Ellis just passed away um, in the last few weeks. Okay, so the question is, did the American Jewish community, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I want to take us back, and here's my uh, uh, the framework I want to argue. If we just stick to American Jews, uh, there was a time, and if you're zoned out, zone back in, because I think this is a really important point. There was a time in the mid-1920s to the mid-1930s where pacifism amongst the American Jewish community was mainstream. That American Jewish groups, establishment groups, uh, 
many of the women's groups, many of the reform movements groups were uh, involved with pacifist organizations. Now, Jews as uh, activists have been involved, like here, Rosa Luxemburg in Europe and Emma Goldman in the United States with anti-war movements, uh, with a kind of universalism. But the people I want to talk to here in the next few minutes are really doing this as Jews. And so I'm recommending to you a book uh, by Melissa Clapper, who's done the incredible research on which some of this is drawn, where when you look at American uh, Jewish women's activism, around uh, the early part of the 20th century. Uh, it's around birth control, it's about suffrage, but it's also largely around pacifism. Uh, you could be part of mainstream American Jewish uh, institutions. Uh, your chapter of the National Council of Jewish Women would be aligned with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. That the International Council of Jewish Women gathered 8 million signatures for disarmament peti a petition in the 19, early 1930s. That Jewish women in the United States mostly, but also in other countries, especially England, were very much involved with their non-Jewish counterparts in the anti-war movements of the 1920s and the 1930s, right? Uh, and so I'm showing you some of these great um, activist women. At this time, women were not becoming rabbis, the, the highest they could reach in the Jewish community were these leadership positions in, uh, say, uh, the uh, National um, uh, Federation of Temple Sisterhood. Uh, and many of them were committed pacifists. Fanny Brin, National Council of Jewish Women, Hannah Greenberg Solomon, and Jane Evans, who becomes the, the top woman in the reform movement for many, many, many decades and was a committed member of pacifist groups, as well as Jewish pacifist groups, uh, uh, through before, through, and after World War II. Now, there's an argument to be made, I'm going to go back to an earlier slide, that World War II ends this, right? And you see a lot of American Jews saying, well, look, uh, the rise of Hitler, we have to defend ourselves, there's mass death, there's mass oppression. Uh, you hear this in the Christian circles, where Reinhold Niebuhr abandons his previous associations for what becomes uh, called re uh, a kind of Christian realism. And yes, many Jews signed up, joined the military. Uh, Stephen uh, Wise, most important rabbi of his day, uh, abandons his committed pacifism in the wake of World War II. There is massive Jewish support for World War II and to a lesser extent to uh, Zionism, which is having some turbulence uh, during the mid-30s with uh, Palestinian uh, and Arab nationalism. But I want to make the argument that actually a lot of these influential pacifists, women and men, they become the, the elders for the next generation of civil rights Jews, uh, Jews who are involved in the civil rights movement, anti-racism, uh, anti-Vietnam War movement, and that you can see World War II was kind of an interruption of what was uh, a kind of mainstream uh, Jewish pacifism. Uh, now, before I go on, let me just pull this back here for a second. Uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s, if a reform rabbi gave a, gave a lecture or sermon about disarmament or the evils of war, Melissa Clapper's great book has shown that this is actually a mainstream opinion. Today, in the American Jewish community, uh, the American Jewish community is mostly, it, it's, not it's not surprising uh, to hear a lecture from a rabbi, a sermon from a rabbi in favor of reproductive rights and reproductive justice. It's, it's not a surprise to hear about uh, uh, Jews are for liberal immigration policy. And we proudly support groups that do refugee resettlement and champion the rights of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants. I would I wouldn't say this is a consensus issue, but in the American Jewish community today, this sort of uh, liberal ta position taking it goes uncon mostly uncontroversial. Uh, what Melissa Clapper shows, although it doesn't explicitly said, is that during the 1920s and 30s, pacifism was that position one of those positions in the Jewish American world. 
in the organized Jewish American world, it would not have been surprising to hear a lecture about um, uh, pacifism. Okay, let me go back to this, uh, to these slides. Okay. Sorry, a little technical difficulty. Okay. Uh, now, uh, there are Jewish pacifists in the 1930s and, and on, not just in America, but also in Palestine. Judah Magnus, American-born um, Zionist who moves to Palestine, helps uh, found him, uh, Hebrew University, becomes part of the binationalist cluster around uh, Buber. Uh, you have um, somebody put Everett Gendler, who was a, a great uh, American Jewish activist and pacifist, uh, his last one recently is he translated and, and organized the writings of Rabbi Aaron Samuel Tamaris, who was a European Orthodox rabbi who advocated for a kind of radical pacifism within Judaism. And you have Israeli citizens who took really pacifist stances, uh, not just sort of like pro-peace or pro-coexistence, but really pacifist stances. I want to bring us back to the American scene. In 1941, a group is founded called the Jewish Peace Fellowship. This was founded by Isidore Hoffman, Jane Evans, who was then the top reform movement, uh, top woman within the reform movement. And uh, my subject, uh, Rabbi uh, Abraham Kronbach, born in Indiana, ends up his career in Cincinnati. Uh, and so the Jewish Peace Fellowship in 1941 was organized to facilitate a CO, a conscientious objector tradition within the Jewish community, so that uh, if you were opposed to war on principle, uh, it can be shown that out of the Jewish uh, tradition, there was a, uh, a, a kind of the receipts or the paper trail for this. Uh, the Jewish Peace Fellowship published several books, pamphlets. It helped many people, many Jewish people become conscientious objectors, some during World War II, some during the uh, Korean conflict, and the Vietnam War, and on. So they're an important uh, uh, group doing mostly CO work, but also beyond that. So Kronbach. Uh, Kronbach was a major figure in the reform movement. He taught at Hebrew, University, uh, Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. Um, he was perhaps got most notoriety for opposing the execution of the Rosenbergs. Many of these pacifists who I'm looking at were lifelong champions of um, uh, who opposed the death penalty. They championed people on death row. Uh, and I'm looking through his letters and seeing all this sort of behind the scenes activism he was doing as well with his rabbinical students in Cincinnati. So Kronbach gives the sermon at the Rosenberg's uh, funeral uh, or memorial service, for example, in New York. Uh, so Kronbach in the 1920s circulated a pledge for Jewish pacifists and many uh, reform rabbis signed it, uh, and although it didn't turn into an organization. He worked with members of the FOR. He worked with uh, many of the leaders of the Quaker world uh, and the Anabaptist world and was intimately involved with trying to stave off the evils that were coming in the 1930s. So here he writes in his book 19, in the late 1930s of all the outrages against the Jew committed by Hitler. None is more calamitous than this. He's banished from the hearts of many of us uh, the, um, the will to peace. Uh, and so if I'm, what I'm saying is right, that will to peace was institutionalized in the American Jewish community where anti-war activism, internationalism uh, was solidified in the institutions of American Judaism. So what happens when the war actually starts, right? He starts the Jewish Peace Fellowship on the eve of World War II in 1941. Uh, well, one thing is he did these, these out-of-the-box things like uh, there was a bunch of German POWs in Ohio, and he went seeking fellowship and reconciliation with them. He, he brought them food and packages, was concerned about their welfare. He wore a yellow star um, throughout the war. Uh, after the war was over, he asked for clemency, uh, not commun communing, but clemency against the death penalty for the Nazi war criminals. Um, uh, Leo Beck, uh, one of the giants of German Judaism, 
uh, also was associated with this pacifist movement, spent a year in Cincinnati, that's him in front of HUC, uh, and commended uh, Abraham Kronbach for wearing a yellow star all through the war as a, as a symbol of solidarity with suffering Jews, Jews suffering in, in, uh, in Europe. And so Kronbach's argument was that the job of pacifism is to stave off war before we get to the point where you have strong men, before you get to the point where you have con conflict, that pacifists have a role in uh, stopping the war, putting the brakes on it, showing that another way of, of orientation towards violence is possible. Now, after all this, you would think if it, this would happen today, he would be persona non grata in the Jewish community. We who speak out against Israel's war in Gaza, right? Whether we do this as Zionists like myself, or whether we do it as anti or non-Zionists, uh, are shunned to the side and say, "How can you be disloyal to the Jewish people? How could you ignore the, the terrors and traumas of October 7th? Uh, Kronbach?" Uh, however, was a member in good standing, so much so that he was asked to speak uh, even after the war about peace in the Jewish tradition. Uh, he was an advisor to synagogues around Cincinnati. Uh, he was not seen as just some crazy person, that his his pacifism and his peaceableness was part of the culture of American Judaism after World War II. Uh, so here's a, a, a quick list of some names you know. Some of you may have known these people. Who, who were part of the Jewish Peace Fellowship uh, from uh, Zalman, Rab, Rob Zalman, uh, the great Naomi Goodman, Will Herberg, uh, Henry Schwartzchild, um, Michael Robinson, uh, and so forth. Now, these are some of these names you're not going to know, but they're names to conjure with. My old neighbor in Philadelphia, Arthur Waskow, uh, the novelist Howard Fast. Uh, these are people in the mainstream of the American Jewish world, and the head of the Hillel at uh, Columbia University for many, many decades, was one of the founders of the Jewish Peace Fellowship and counseled and advised and influenced generations of, of smart, uh, active, uh, good Jewish souls around Columbia University. And, and so I see a direct line between this pre-World War II pacifism, at the organization, the Jewish Peace Fellowship, and onto the the dynamism of the Jewish uh, support network for the for the civil rights movement in the '60s, uh, of which you know uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel. There he is on stage in April fourth, uh, nineteen sixty seven, when King gives his uh, "Time to Break Silence" uh, speech at Riverside Church. Uh, Susanna Heschel is sitting in the audience. She tells me. Uh, there's Heschel and his involvement and influence over the next generation of rabbis uh, and committed to anti-war movement. Um, and then uh, an interesting theologian, I just want to give a shout out to Stephen Schwartzchild, uh, who articulates the most sophisticated Jew theology of Jewish pacifism and radical ethics that I know. Uh, his works are being now reissued and organized. Uh, okay, I want to give a, one quick uh, counterpoint here. Max Kapelman, some of you may have known him or know of him, was one of these Jewish men who was counseled by the Jewish Peace Fellowship, became a conscientious objector during World War II, and participated in the Great Hunger Experiment in Minnesota. This was an experiment where conscientious objectors volunteered to test the limits, their body's limits of limited um, nourishment, because they knew that Europe and there was going to be many people uh, who were going to be ill, and they wanted to do, run some experiments on how well the body could adopt or readopt to uh, calorie deprivation. He said in late, late in life, this was the most important thing he ever did. Later in life, he drops his pacifism, become, but, but becomes one of the architects of arms control between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so he had some very interesting reasons for dropping his pacifism. But even in, in old age, he said, the most important thing I ever did was this anti-war movement. Okay, so here's my argument in a nutshell. Uh, for those of you just joining, here's what I just argued. Organized Jewish pacifists held establishment positions in the Jewish community before, uh, during, and after uh, World War II. They advocated for a range of positions towards Israel uh, from uh, binationalism to anti-Zionism in the American Council for Judaism to a kind of Zionist two-state solutionism 
out of Gray Ra. They seeded these Jewish pacifists, a network of intellectuals, activists, rabbis, uh, who were shaped and community authorities shaped by pacifist sensibilities. And alongside of CO, attended to a range of issues, uh, death penalty, mass incarceration, questions of civil liberty, and the black freedom struggle. And maybe, I would say, maybe this is a bit of controversy. They are articulated a different sort of pacifism, different than Christian absolutism, more towards pragmatism, but non nonetheless committed to um, eliminating violence in the world. Uh, they also engage with a network of Christian pacifists that continued uh, through the civil rights era. Um, okay, so to wrap up here, because we want to get to your questions in Q&A, um, I want to say that there's a, a big room for a Jewish pacifist agenda that uh, for today. And here are just some obvious ones. Nonviolent approaches to anti-Semitism and anti-Semites. And I have some great examples of that if you want to hear. Uh, avoiding the glorification of the IDF and military operations as a way of conflict resolution in Israel and Palestine, uh, Jewish continuing Jewish projects of solidarity engagement, opposition to the death penalty, opposition to war industries, and opposition to structural violence around racism and also around health care and others. So I'm hoping that whatever comes out of the Jewish Peace Fellowship will entail a lot of these projects. As you all know, I hope you know, there's a lot of Jewish groups working to an end to hostilities in Israel and Palestine. There's a lot of Jewish groups committed to a peaceable coexistence, a two state or one state or whatever solution. And I think uh, while that field has been uh, captured, that, well, that's not the right language. While there's many people, many people working on um, this work, I believe that there's still room for forging uh, a Jewish culture that's opposed to these forms of violence and addressing the evils of violence, structural violence, as well as more explicit forms of, of war. And uh, I think this is not a new thing. This is a return both to the Judaism, the American Judaism of the 1920s and 30s, but it's also a return to Jewish values, uh, a stream of Jewish values that we can see in rabbinic Judaism uh, for, since, you know, late antiquity. Uh, so this is not out of nowhere, uh, but I think we have, a, we have a lot of work to do um, and uh, I'll brush by those. And why don't I stop here? Um, Ariel has some questions. I'm, so, I'm sure all of you have some questions. I am muted. I can't ask any questions while I'm muted. So I, I want to start out with the difficult questions, of course, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the most difficult, we you talked about pacifism um, helping to prevent a war and in the lead up. Uh, but what, how do you respond to the argument? And it could be made from uh, Palestinians. It is currently right now being made from Palestinians that you are left no other choice sometimes uh, when attacked, whether that's on October 7th or whether it is um, decades of occupation and siege against Palestinians. And then, of course, in the big way that we Jews grapple with when it is uh, the rise of Nazism. How does how do you how do you. Uh, square pacifism in that context? There are several ways to do it. and uh, I'm not sure if I've landed on my own opinion about this. One is, uh, first of all, the term pacifism has different meanings to different groups of people in the 1920s, 30s, and after. Some were saying, like if you all saw the movie Oppenheimer, Niels Bohr comes up to Oppenheimer and says, is that bomb big enough? Why is he asked that? He's hoping it will end all wars for all time, that one act of atrocity is going to get rid of warfare in humanity's history. And so Niels Bohr considers himself a kind of pacifist, somebody who's going to end all wars. And there, there are pacifists who believe in personal self-defense. Uh, there are people who would say they are anti-war. Martin Buber himself said, I'm not a pacifist. I am a peacemaker in the biblical prophetic tradition. And so we're jumping around a lot of terms. There was one of the Jewish Peace Fellowship people who said that they were a pacifoid, that they were against war in nearly all cases except for dramatic wars of self-defense. 
I think uh, if we talk about anti-colonial violence in which sometimes October 7th is framed, and I have to say a lot of my students uh, have no patience with this anymore. That is, they don't have any patience with an idea of pacifism or Martin Luther King or Gandhian sort of traditions uh, and who see resistance as licit, any form of, of resistance. I think the pacifist position has to be that violence is to be avoided at all costs, that there are forms of resistance that are nonviolent that have to be tried. You saw this during the first intifada where you had American pacifists trained Palestinians doing all sorts of very creative things and trying to get away from violent confrontation with war. You're not gonna out violence a nation state, a, a well-armed state. And so when you do violence against a state, we should expect that a state re replies with violence. That's the way states are, a kind of necessary evil that inevitably inflict evil on others. So I believe, I mean, who am I to say, but like that there are plenty of nonviolent forms of resistance, forms of engagement that were not tried before, before October 7th. There were some that were met by violence by the the IDF uh, at the at the at the wall in Gaza, hundreds of Palestinians killed in a non mostly nonviolent protest. But we also have to say that there's not an ongoing um, that that people are are stuck within their trauma and not seeing the possibilities of organizing nonviolently outside that. Uh, now this is not to lecture the oppressed. But we recall Reinhold Niebuhr's insight that the oppressed are not free of sin either, that they are also stuck within uh, a limited way of seeing their own position, and there has to be dialogue and ways of pulling ourselves out of the inevitably counterproductive moves of violence. So in the meantime, this is a theoretical woulda, coulda, shoulda uh, answer, but in the meantime, we right now have to dedicate ourselves to nonviolent forms of living a life, uh, and especially our collective lives. And just like Kronbach saying, we pacifists didn't do enough to set, to head off uh, World War II. So for example, he tried to get a, together a, meet, a meeting of Nazi leaders and Jewish leaders to kind of bury the hatchet so that we wouldn't have this global conflagration coming in the 1930s, right? He wanted the Quakers to broker it. He wanted to show Nazis or people sympathetic to Nazi Germany that Jews could reach out their hands in friendship and understanding. And I'm sure most of the people on this call know that the people who have been engaging with Hamas have been those peacemaking Jews and pacifist Jews in Palestine uh, who are making the connection, who see uh, members of Hamas as human and try to engage with them. And they have been responsible for some of the um, over, I can't say this last year, but in previous years, um, sort of uh, behind the scenes engagement and negotiation over uh, uh, prisoners of war and, and other other situations. So thank you. And before we continue, I, I'm just going to um, make a request, not a request, actually, a requirement uh, in the chat that folks refrain from using language that conflates Israelis with Jews or suggests a type of um, uh, uh, characteristic that is inherently violent among either Jews or Israelis, though that is unacceptable um, in the chat. And anyone who, if, if that gets engaged in, I'll have to either close the chat or um, ask pe certain people to leave. Um, so I, I'm gonna require folks to be very, very mindful that we not, um, slip into biased language. Um, so we, we have a conversation going on in the chat that, that isn't about this. So, uh, but I want to, um, to, to ask you to address it. So uh, you identified yourself as a Zionist and it's, it's very common these days. And I have to say, I've been grappling with this and changing in, in my views in many ways um, that, uh, that Zionism, a very common understanding of Zionism, which I actually was mine in for many ways and I've been grappling with. And thanks to some FOR folks for um, inspiring that grappling with me. Um, that it is this, uh, that it equates directly 
to uh, like um, anti-black racism, right? That it is a, a form of racism, like anti-black racism is a form of racism, et cetera, et cetera. And yet I, I hear you who identify as a pacifist, also identifying as a Zionist. And um, I wanna point that, the, that, it, that Zionism is more complex than um, other forms of racism or some forms of racism. And I want to uh, suggest if you could help explain that sure. what might seem uh, like a contradiction in your identity. Sure. So um, I come out of a socialist Zionist tradition that sought to create a just society, not necessarily an ethno state as we have now. Right. I, along with Noam Chomsky and other uh, activists around the world, there was there were streams and strands of Zionism that sought uh, peaceful coexistence, Jewish safety and the creation of a just society. Right. Uh, we're not in it for the racism. We're not in it for the colonialism. We're not in it for the expulsion. We're not in it for the domination of one people over another. You see this in the visions of some of the early Zionist leaders. There were other visions that were a lot more colonial and racist. Uh, the people I work with, and I think I sit on top of a lot of people who are would say that they are um, part of those Zionist traditions and are aghast at, at what the state of Israel has become and who are fighting against Israeli militarism and who are fighting against the kind of racism that we, we all agree on. I think we can all agree on that, right? And that uh, there, but I can I can do this. I see because I am committed to a Jewish national project that's not dominating, that's not racist, that's not colonial, and that that's where when I turn to the Jewish community, I'm in a better position than if I'm outside of the Jewish community, just saying, oh, it was all it was all a wash. So many progressives were supporting uh, the Jewish the Jewish national project as a way of refugee resettlement, as something to do, to, to manage the uh, the masses of suffering Jews during World War II and before. But I think it's semantics. What it matters is what you come down to, where are you going to, um, what are you going to do to make a difference? There's a lot of harsh voices that will say, well, Zionism was always something like, and he, like there's no such thing as a decolonial Zionism, or Zionism equals support of the state of Israel's violence. And that's clearly, there's ways around that. And I find that kind of, um, it's understandable why people say that. And I understand why Palestinians say that. But think about this. If you're an, an elderly Polish man and you've lived under communism for 50 years, you think the democratic socialists of America are part and parcel of that totalitarian force that made your life miserable for 50 years. And you would argue that you can see it back in the writings of Karl Marx, that violence ready and domination ready to happen. So I feel like we have to understand the Zionist movements and thinking is a, is a variety of forms of thought. It was not always inevitably racist, colonial, and so forth. We oppose that stream that became dominant, whether you call it political Zionism or ethno-national Zionism or right-wing Zionism, and we mourn the mistakes that well-meaning Zionists made, right? Nevertheless, right now, what we, we, we have to do, and I think what we can all agree on, is that we have to pump the brakes, if not try to stop with all of our being, Israel's uh, in consideration of non-combatants, its destruction of Gaza. I mean, it's just terrible. Uh, to do that, I want to suggest, I didn't quite read all the chat, but I saw a little bit of it, is when you start talking about Nazism and the Holocaust, the Jews of the new Nazis, you're just trolling us with our own trauma. Well, that doesn't feel right. You need to come up with some other metaphors or just empirically describe the evils that the state of Israel are doing in the name of their own safety and which many American Jews support out of a confused uh, sense of their own trauma and their own self-interest. Uh, American Jews, for the most part, share the values of progressives are standing for progressive values. But when it comes to Israel, it becomes a question of, of, of nervousness, anxiety around the traumas that we have experienced over the last centuries. And we have to work around that, work with it, and not just say, well, forget these Jews, and they're just, they're just in it for the genocide. I think that's the wrong way to go about it.
Thank you so much for that um, beautiful response. And, I, and I'm happy to uh, continue to engage with folks on this particular topic. Like I said, I've um, grown and changed on it, uh, thanks to some FOR members um, initiating this, this kind of grappling. Um, I have a question from Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb. And uh, the most extreme purveyors of violence, of course, like uh, are the, you know, the US, right? And, uh, and we need to own and name much more so than Israel. We certainly dwarf Israel's um, actions of violence. Uh, what are the tactics and strategies of nonviolent resistance that we and how like liberation encampments and how can we operationalize our nonviolent values in ways to produce a good outcome for the besieged? And if somebody's um yes. So I have a great pitch to make. It's with the Quaker lobby, the FCNL. Uh they are one of the leaders of the ceasefire effort. Now let me tell you, a lot of look, I've been an activist for many years, and so have you all of you, right? There's part of us that is that are generated by the Yetzer Hara. Uh, that is, we do this partially out of ego and partially out of uh, self-righteousness. That's when our righteousness becomes self-righteous. I think we've all been uh, have have this dark moment at a, at a time. Um, as Simone Weil once said, people will will stand in line for a long time for bread, but how long will they stand in line to save a life? And let me say. The real work to, to draw down the violence of the American empire is boring work. It is setting up meetings with reps. It's talking with people that you don't have the same class background or agree with over various forms of politics. The hard work of peacemaking requires a, a long-term strategy, and it requires us to suppress the ego forces, the Yates or Hara in ourselves to do the hard work of advocacy, to do the hard work of organizing, not just the feel good moments of protest. I mean, I like a good protest in a march myself, right? I feel empowered. There's people around me who, who share my passion, but there's a lot of work we as the progressive or the left or the peaceable people are not doing. And I think that's the hard work that needs to be done. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, to address war industries and 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 the ar the armaments of the U.S. going to uh, to scenes of war, especially in Palestine, um, we need to be out there with the radical nuns protesting the the, the places that create these wars. Uh, we need to be talking to people who are not like us, who have more violent dispositions, who see violence as a way of solving things. And not in a self-righteous way, but in using the careful patient strategies. Um, and I think this is also one strategy for addressing anti-Semitism, is that my impulse is not to criminalize or police anti-Semitism. It's to sit down and, and talk and to see what's going on. And I think that if we're really pacifists, this is one of the, the, the tactics that we have to try. It's not for everybody. Not everyone has the disposition. And not everyone's in the right position to be able to do that. So I think the, the the long work of this means being peaceable people and strategic, strategic about how we can start changing American society um, by changing our neighbors. Uh, all organizing is relational, says the Alinsky tradition. And too many of us have been disconnected without relationship of the people we disagree with, writing them off as hopeless. And so I think working with the FCNL has been very empowering because they have shown uh, a very slow burn path of, of changing the way American foreign policy goes in the Middle East. So I urge you all, I'll put in the chat maybe, to sign up for the FCNL and their, uh, their efforts on a variety of issues, but especially on Middle East policy. Find yourselves with Quakers and other uh, peaceniks who are meeting with, with elected officials, who are doing the neighbor to neighbor work of changing opinions. Rabbi, I hope that's uh, that makes I some sense. I have a similar uh, question. Um, it, it, of course it makes sense. And I think a lot of us 
have been doing legislative advocacy for years. Um, we've we've kind of hit a dead, more or less a dead wall there, even in terms of the ceasefire effort. Um, I guess I'm, and there's communities of, I mean, there there is momentum that we've never seen before, for instance, on the question of Palestine. Never seen this kind of momentum ever. Um, black clergy, um, communities of color, there, there is this growing awareness of the connection, the global connections. So I guess I'm asking you more specifically if you are feeling in your circles the ri of rising tactics that, that are coming up in your communities. We've seen the Mennonites step in. We are in this moment of where we really need to come together and talk about what we've all been doing and where we are right now, because um, there is a lot of momentum, but people are getting to this point, especially as we, as we face the possible reelection of Trump with great weariness and, and, and a sort of a despair. So I'm just, that's, that's the space in which I'm hoping you might, um, yeah. Into. Um, I fear I don't have absolute wisdom on this. I am. I thought one of the best things was the non-committed movement. And why did that work? Is because the interest, you know, we, we've been for too long trying to appeal to people's moral side. You got to appeal to their interest. My rabbi Alinsky teaches. And when you had the, the non-committed movement where it was actually affecting votes and turnout, that send the signal, and you saw a little bit of movement within the policy circles. Uh, now, a little bit of movement is something that we should grab onto. So talking with the FCNL this week, uh, talking about getting some um, ships out, th U.S. ships that will take in and save thousands of lives through doing medical procedures instead of the, the pier that flew away, right? So these are that's not ending the war, right? But it, it, it's, it's, it's addressing some of the reducing some of the suffering. Um, but, you know, this work has to be done because it's good in itself. It, it helps when it's effective. Uh, and so we have to get with other friends and comrades and be with people and do this work. And you all know that there were other times when things looked very despairing and very dark and people continued the work and we'll see what's on the other end. I don't know if that's a wise reply. <laughs> But it's one I try to, you know, pep talk my students and my charges with. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rabbi Lynn, for joining us. And <laughs> it won't be long before I ask you to do a whole um, gathering voices with us. Um, I have uh, an another question very similar. This is from John Fairfield. And then we're going to get ready to close out. Um, so we'll do this question. Then I want to ask how folks can uh, reach you and such. So uh, don't leave before the end. Uh, John Fairfield says, I appreciated Elliot's mentioning pacifists who engage their enemies as humans, even as humans capable of recognizing in their turn the humanity of the pacifists. And I appreciate his recognition that states, by their very structure, are ill-suited to walk us out of violent confrontation. So my question, how do we engage our enemies in a way that circumvents and actually co-ops their respective state structures? Can answer that one. I'll give you an award. Um, I don't know about state structures. That's a big ask. <laughs> oh, by the way, some of you have like individually, like emailing me in the chat. Like I can't figure that out right now. So email me at the Gmail, right? <laughs> and please do. Um, I do want to say though that okay now we're gonna get a little i thought we we're gonna have a conversation about theology and religion here right that's what you're we can come back and have another conversation about theology and religion because oh. I, I can do this many times look i'm really bad the the answer, her, to that one <laughs> the bad inclination and the bad inclination is strong with me and i have to note please give me a can i get an amen somewhere that sometimes my work with pastors pastors can be really like violent people interpersonally <laughs> right like rude, impatient, me too, right? Me too, like it's in me. And and in some ways I've become a convinced pacifist precisely because of the bad inclination is strong with me. And the work that I'm doing, I, I wanna think is really important, right? 
And so if we can turn that bad inclination to the good and be effective, right? And so how do we change our enemies? I think we really need to listen. We need to, we need to think about people not as idiots, not as bad souls, but as people in need. And I'll give you two recommendations. Oh, my Lord, this is such a great timing. One, okay, Hidden Brain this week talks about why people get radicalized in, ext in extremism, the social psychology of that. So listen to Hidden Brain from this week, you know, that podcast about social psych. And the other was the best thing I've read about this. I'm sorry to say I haven't read that much, but I and I and a lot of my colleagues agree is Naomi Klein's book, Doppelganger, which came mm. out last year. Doppelganger yeah. starts off as like a ha ha, look at these crazy people. And by the end of it, it's the most musarnic book. It's saying, we have to realize that these people are suffering and are, are victims of larger global things outside of their control. And so I think Naomi Klein's book, Doppelganger, really gives us a loving and righteous, like a kind of left progressive perspective on why our neighbors refuse to take vaccines, oppose the, the lockdowns, are attracted to QAnon, maybe are attracted to the violence of the state of Israel. And for we Jews, we have a real, I mean, I try to talk to a lot of Jewish community people about this without the impatient judgment that they are absolutely on the wrong side of history, but to understand where they are coming from, why they are responding this way, and to appeal to the same values that we we share, right? We don't want to pe see people suffering. We don't want to see civilians injured. We don't want to see their apartments blown up, their hospitals closed. So I think we have, and this is an, a work, a patience that, that requires patience and even headedness and training. And, and, and that's tough. It's a tough job, but we have to try it while we're going off and marching, while we're trying to end the war machine, right? But I think we have to take, be serious that part of the problem is we are ineffective vessels for some of this work and we need to attune ourselves to make ourselves better vessels for this and this is where i think the world of religion but also sort of patient training uh non-violent communication and so forth and i'm not very good at all these things uh, comes in to discipline us uh, so we ourselves have to subordinate ourselves to make ourselves better um, um vessels for the tough work that needs to happen to not write off people as so other that they are beyond redemption. And uh, maybe to end on this little point, a few summers ago, I read a bunch of memoirs by former skinheads and neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And to see like, is there some magic formula to walk people away? There's a great book about Derek Black who went to New College, who was uh, a, an heir to a white supremacist family. And, and lo and behold, I noticed there was like a, a Jewish person in a lot of these stories reaching their hand out in friendship to talk to these people, to see where they're coming from and to be with them and to walk them away from their worst impulses. And I think if we, if we are pacifists, if we are in this fellowship and committed to some reconciliation, this is a tactic we might try to prepare to do, uh, to open our ears, and, and while we're doing the structural political advocacy work, activism work, but we, we might want to become better people who engage with others in their, I don't know, if, take a Christian word, sin, right? And we might learn something about ourselves along the way to make our own work more effective and our comportment to other people, our neighbors, more just. Thank you. Can I so get an amen somewhere? Amen. <laughs> I know this conversation has been fascinating and I could go on for an hour and go into um, uh, uh, theology, but uh, as, as we're out of time, but we would love to have you back another time. How can folks keep up with your work, uh, social media accounts? I know you put your email in the chat once, but we can do so again. Um, when is your book? We'll start with when is your book coming out? Oh yeah, when I finish writing it. <laughs> uh, but, more, but more importantly than a book that, that sits on the shelf unread, more importantly is that we're trying to revive the Jewish Peace Fellowship and make it more reflective of the values of, of and, and to fill a space that's not there yet on the Jewish left. The, the movement ecology of the Jewish left has a place 
the Jewish Peace Fellowship. So uh, if you're if you're Jewish or you know a Jewish pacifist or peacemaker in the prophetic tradition, uh, yeah, send me an email. Uh, I want to put together a sort of temporary advisory group and a new younger board of advisors and a whole agenda that none of the other excellent groups, I think like Trua or um, uh, the Rabbis for Ceasefire, other groups are doing. I think there's a lot of room for Jewish progressives to do more engagement with the non-Jewish world in smart strategic ways um, and um, make Judaism a pacifist community again, like it was in the 20s and the 30s. We've got some great Jews in this conversation here. I see uh, Gus Kaufman, my dear friend, uh, Rabbi David Cooperman, who is among those uh, Jewish, great Jewish peacemakers. So um, we will, if you didn't get uh, Elliot's email, I will send out a follow-up email on how to get in touch with him, as well as um, a link to the video so that you can watch it again and, and dive in deeper. And um, Elliot, thank you so much for joining us for this really important conversation in this critical moment. Thanks for having me. And thanks all of you for being here. I really, really appreciate it. And would love to hear your comments. Yeah. And this has been taped. I think it'll be replayed. Yes, yes. yes, it will be up on YouTube as well as the uh as well as FOR's website and sent around to all of you. Thanks so much.